The reading this morning is Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 9, and it's entitled, No Confidence in the Flesh. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord. Salam Subahir. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, d- I have Anthony's permission just to take a couple of moments to share something personal. And that is that yesterday I went to the cathedral, and uh, that was the, to say that that signaled the end of my time as a reader or a licensed lay minister. Uh, I'm not being re licensed. And uh, the reason that I'm not being re licensed is that. What I've been praying for for a long time is that God would develop the gifts of the people in our fellowship, and that's happening. We have lots of younger people who are using their talents that God has given them and developing them, and it's a huge joy and delight. Steve among them, and we have Sarah and Ken going to complete their training this year, and Amani just starting. So we thank God for that's wonderful. And uh, so it seems the right time to stand back and make more room. Um, I just want to ask for this time for two things. And the first was to say thank you to you. Um, I've been a reader for 24 years. I've been on the ministry team for 28 years. And it's been such a privilege to share God's word with you. Um, It's just been joy for me. And I want to thank you because... In this place, from you, I've always had encouragement and help and um, kindness uh, and continue to do so, and examples to learn from every day. So I'm grateful to God for that. And, and I want to say thank you to God uh, and to Anthony for that. You know, uh, and I want to say thank you to God because when I started out as a Christian at 15, I couldn't see what was ahead, and to have reached this grand old age, uh, God is more exciting now to me, more magnificent, bigger and greater than he was when I was 15. There's more to find out about him. I'm more excited every day about that, and I discover new things every day, and I still want to go out and catch somebody by the collar and share them with them. So none of that changes. And you know we don't retire from God's work. We, we serve him as long as he gives us breath. So it's no big deal. But, it, but it, it is to pay tribute to him, to his faithfulness and to his keeping, and to say thank you to you. Um, uh, you haven't quite got rid of me because I'm, till the end of this, this preaching rotor, I'll be around till the end of May at the frontier. And of course, you are still my church, so nothing changes. But thank you. In God, thank you. You'll, you'll, uh, you'll do for me if you do that. We'll, we'll get on to something more interesting. Shall we just pray before we share God's word? Uh, 
our Father, we do thank you that you are our God forever and forever. And we just pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes this morning to see the wonderful things in your word and to change us through them. In Jesus. Amen. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen the television programme, Who Do You Think You Are? Anybody seen it? Yes. Well, the idea is that they choose some famous person who, and they look into their family background. Uh, they find out the interesting characters there. And it's fascinating to look back and people trace their forebears. And uh, I, I remember one that was uh, the comedian Danny Dyer, who found that he was related to Edward III. So he appeared wearing historical dress and, and looking suitably kingly. Uh, and he thought it was quite something for an East Ender. Well, it is fascinating. We sometimes put a lot of stock on who we are, who we think we are, on our background, uh, on our achievements. And if you think of that in a social field, we get our identity from it, from who we are, where we're placed. But it's a different thing, isn't it, when we think about who we are in the sight of God, the one who made us. Where do we stand? Who do we think we are in relation to our God? And that's exactly what Paul is dealing with in this section of Philippians. Excuse me. As he comes into this section, he begins, I, I was laughing this morning because it sounds a, a knell in the heart of every preacher. He begins with the word finally. Finally. Well, that's it. And then he starts up again. Uh, you know it. You've heard it. You've been suffered from it. Um, from all of us. Um, and, and then he goes on and he says, look, I'm going to repeat myself. That's another fault of preachers. I'm going to repeat myself. But you know, he doesn't apologize for this. He doesn't say, I'm sorry. He says, watch, oh, you need this. You need me to keep saying it. You need me to repeat it again and again and again and again. Because this is key. This is the center of everything, what I'm going to say to you today. And it is the center of everything. Because what he's dealing with is our standing before God. The righteous in Christ. He's dealing with how we become acceptable to a perfect God. How we stand before him. How we're accepted by him. Righteousness, we use that word and we don't use it very often in ordinary speech. But we're talking about a right standing before our God. You notice he started this chapter with rejoice in the Lord. And that's why he's opened this up again. Because there can't be a life of joy. There can't be a life of peace. There can't be a life of hope. Unless that hope is in the Lord. So to be righteous in Christ is to stand before God and have a right standing before God. And that's where he begins. How, how do we do this? How do we do it? And before he starts, he has a little angry outburst. It's a, a real passionate bit of um, invective against a group of people. And I have said this before, but I, I think you'll observe it and, and find it to be true that when you get really cross with somebody or with something they're doing, you often find that it's because it's a fault you have yourself, isn't it? It's a, it's a thing that really annoys you because it reflects what, what you have, your own shortcomings. And Paul looks at this group of people. Who are they? Well, they're people who insist on all the rules and regulations. They're people who think they have a fine position with God because of what they've done. They're people who offer God as a favor their service, their life, their goodness. And they think that they're doing a good job for him. 
And Paul looks at them and he says, just watch out for these people. They're danger. They're going to destroy you. But he also says and recognizes, I was just like them. Before I met Jesus, before I came face to face with Jesus, I was like them. And he he looks in horror at this group. And he says, I was just like them. I stood where they stand. I felt very confident in myself, in who I was. He says, you know, as regard to ticking the boxes, I'd done it all. I had it all. You know, Paul must have been the rising star in the party of the Pharisees. And here he lays it all out. Look at it. If anybody thinks he has things to boast about, if anybody thinks he has things to be confident about, well, that person was me. I was born into the right family. I, was, I, I, I wasn't a convert. I was a Jew by birth. I was a Jew by background. I had a good family. I came from Jewish parentage. I belonged to a favored tribe, an elite tribe, the tribe of Benjamin, down near Jerusalem, a holy city. My background was perfect. You know, real Jewish royalty. And then he said, I look at my achievements. Look what I was. I, not for me, the, the common one of people. I joined the really pure people, the Pharisees, the people who are determined to serve God in everything, to do it according to the law, the letter of the law. And he said, I was one of those. That's how I did it. That's how I went about it day by day. And he said, not only that, you couldn't find fault with me. I was so enthusiastic, gave all my energy to it. He said, so much so that I hated people who opposed us like the Christians. I persecuted them. And he said, if you, if you looked at the regulations, oh, you wouldn't find that slipped up on one. Paul felt he was a man who could go to bed at night saying, I'm a good person. I'm, I'm a good person. And then he met Jesus. He came face to face with the Son of God. And suddenly all that self-righteousness that self-righteousness which had enabled him to look down at other people who were lesser, which had enabled him to feel secure in himself, it all just crumbled. It just went. He was like somebody who thinks he's a multi-millionaire. He's got money in the bank for life. And then overnight, the currency becomes worthless. It's not worth anything. And he finds himself bankrupt. You'll see a a picture on the screen. I bet you'd never thought you'd come to church and see a picture of dog dirt. Because that's what it is. Dog dirt. Because when Paul looks at his life, he looks at himself and he says, you know, I looked at all those things that I thought made me. And he said, suddenly they were repellent. They were repellent to me. They were just like dog dirt because that's what I am compared with the God that I want to please. You know, we stand in the face of the maker of heaven and earth. We stand in the face of the one who made us, who gave us everything. We can't, there's nothing we can claim. Our talents, our achievements, our background, there's nothing Nothing that we can claim. And if we try to offer it, then it it is. It's like a dirty offering. Isaiah uses another picture. The picture that Isaiah uses is menstrual cloths. Repulsive, dirty, filthy. That's what all our petty little good deeds look like in the face of a holy God. They have no value. It's like, you know, you're trying to buy a present for a member of the royal family. 
What do you get for the person who's got everything? You can't give them anything. You can't offer them anything. And so we come with empty hands because it's the only way we can come to God. We come pleading nothing, claiming nothing, successful in nothing, achieving nothing. We come just as we are. We come to him with empty hands. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I claim. We throw ourselves on the mercy of Jesus, God who loves us in Jesus. And then as a gift, as a gift, we're given clean clothes. We put on a purity that's not ours. And then God comes to live in us and he begins to make us that person who is like Christ. We go back to last week, we become obedient. We want to do what he wants. We want to follow in his footsteps. We want to please him. Because it's all been done. Because he's given us our standing. And he's given us our position in him. So when Paul begins to look at his life. And he weighs it up. And he sees that what was in the prophet account. Is actually a waste of time. What he'd added up and totaled as his achievement. Is nothing. That becomes loss. And the profit, the gain, is righteous in Christ. The gain is Jesus. The gain is that relationship, knowing Jesus. Being in a relationship with the God who made the earth through his son, Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. doesn't matter. Our background doesn't matter. Our ethnicity doesn't matter. Our educational achievements don't matter. Our wealth doesn't matter. None of it matters. We join hands at the cross of Jesus and we are totally equal because the only acceptance we have is in him. I am accepted, Paul says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. To the praise of the glory of his grace. It's all about him. It's all about him. Brothers and sisters, isn't that a relief? Surely that's a relief. You know yourself. I know myself. You know what we are. You know how we slip up. You know that... Until the day that God calls us, he is changing us, but we're not perfect. So what a relief that we rely on the mercy and the goodness and the grace and the purity and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That is who gives us our identity. It is he who makes us who we are. We are righteous in Christ. And so I have... I have clean clothes, pure clothes. I have a beautiful dress. Jesus takes me by the hand, takes me into the presence of his father, takes you into the family of Christ. We're accepted in him, in the beloved. And God looks at his beloved and he takes us into the family. And do you know why it's important? Do you know why Paul says, I've got to keep repeating this? Because our pride enters into this. We keep thinking and we go back and back and we fall into the same trap of thinking, I can do it myself. It's about me. It's about how hard I try or what I do. And it's not. We know that. You know, human pride is such a big thing. You think about it in normal life. We just receive an invitation to somebody's house. What do we do? Uh, I said to Clive this morning, there's an Irish expression, I love it. You don't go with your two arms the same length. When you go to visit somebody, you take them something. A bunch of flowers, a glass of wine, a a bottle of wine, um, whatever. You don't go with your two arms the same length. And we want to do that with God. 
We want to say, look, I'm bringing you this. This is me. We want to keep our end up, and we can't do it. So don't let's try. Let's throw ourselves on the mercy of God in Christ. And that gives us confidence, you know. It gives us confidence because the faith that we share is not about us, it's about him. And it's wanting other people. The best definition of being a Christian that I know is one beggar who tells another beggar where to find bread. That's exactly what I am before God. A beggar who's found bread in Jesus and who wants to tell other people to find that bread. Shall we just pray? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, that it's your blood and righteousness, our beauty, our, our glorious dress. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you that we are righteous in him. Thank you that we are accepted in the beloved. Amen.